Welcome to the page of crime. Here we go over real crimes that took place. On this episode, we're going to go over the murder of Vivian Graham, a notorious hard man and doorman from Newcastle in the United Kingdom, one of the biggest party cities at the time. But it wasn't all glamour. The job came with its own set of dangers. Viv was not just a doorman, he was a hard man, a title earned through blood, sweat and sheer determination. Vivian Graham was born in December 1959 to Hazel and Eric Graham. He grew up well and had a happy childhood. Viv Graham grew up in the village of Highfield, in Rowlands Gill, located on the outskirts of Gateshead, with his siblings Eric and Karen. Childhood friends and former teachers of his have said that Viv was kind and considerate. He was very helpful and had a positive attitude and would go on trips with his older brother Eric. Viv's prospects after school were impacted due to the lack of jobs available in Tyneside, steelworks, factories and shipyards began closing down. That would cause a lot of unemployment, a lot of people with no jobs had to depend on unemployment benefit. Viv would also have to leave his little village to go and find work. Soon after he would choose boxing as his way out, his apprenticeship would be served in an old school boxing club in the neighbouring village of Chopwells. As a middleweight of 5'11", he had big shoulders and a thin waist. He had a strong set of legs and could move. Viv was very fit. His strength was his punching from distance, and he was quick. He was at one stage on the cusp of fighting for England. Viv Graham toured the country competing in the Amateur Boxing Association Championships. During the 1977 season, he was crowned the BA Northeast Champion. He once made it to the later stages of the National BA Championships. He met an opponent that had figured out his technique and wouldn't allow Viv to fight from a distance. Viv would lose this fight. This fight would have got him selected for the England national team. Viv stuck with boxing for a while and later thought bouts at heavyweight, but would eventually step away from it altogether. Viv was all about being fit and healthy. The gym was a regular place for him. Soon after boxing, Graham wanted to become a doorman. Paul Palance was a man with a reputation when it came to handling himself. He was already controlling doors. Bars and pubs would contact him to keep trouble away. Viv would get in touch with Paul, and he would help him out. Paul introduced him to a man called Billy Robinson, who was a major figure in the door security business. Before he knew it, Viv had his first door, a nightclub in Gateshead, just around the corner from a pub Paul was looking after. Paul would later become a professional boxer himself, he watched on as Viv quickly set about building his own career, and Viv was beginning to make his name as a doorman, just as Newcastle was becoming one of the biggest party cities. By the mid-80s, the area was opening dozens of new bars, the likes of which the city had never seen before. Fancy cocktails, chandeliers, chrome on the bars, live music, the works. He became one of the gatekeepers to a party city. This was an era before door staff were licensed or vetted, Bouncers were hired on the basis of their reputations for being able to handle trouble. A lot of Viv fights were caused mostly by guys that would queue up for ages just to be told they cannot come in. Guys that had too much to drink, troublemakers and drug dealers. Viv wasn't anyone to play with. If he had to hurt you, he would. And it wasn't long before he was operating a small group of doormen himself, protecting various licensed premises in central Newcastle, Biker and Wall's End. By this time, he was a well-known, hard man with an intimidating presence. By now, Viv was around 17 stone and could bench press 520 pounds. Viv Graham made a fortune protecting pubs and clubs, while on the other hand, he was also addicted to gambling and spending most of what he earned. Eventually, ended up working with well-known Gateshead hard men, Billy Robinson and Paddy Leonard. Viv would routinely charge pubs £50 per week for protection and clubs as much as £1,000 per week. And so the exploding club scene rocketed his profits and kept him busy in his stronghold, which spanned Tyneside and beyond. Graham would start dating Anna in 1985 after chatting with her in a bar he was working the doors at. They would meet up regular for drinks and meals. They would make each other aware of their situation. Anna had five children from a previous relationship, and Viv would let her know that he had a previous relationship with Gillian Lowe's that was over, but she was currently pregnant with their child. He would soon move to Walkerville, Newcastle upon Tyne, with Anna Connolly and her five children from a previous relationship. Graham acted as a stepfather to the children, and they in return viewed him as their father. When the party drug, 
ecstasy landed in the late 1980s, it sparked vicious battles among the criminal underworld, dealing with the gangs who would try and extort money from pubs and clubs and collecting debts often required Viv to use his brute force. Viv Graham's pub and club protection empire spanned Newcastle and beyond. It was built entirely on his reputation for ruthless violence. Viv wanted to run most of the doors in Newcastle. From the late 1980s, ecstasy and house music were sweeping into Newcastle, revolutionising the city's nightlife and transforming organised crime, with big profits to be made. There was a ferocious and violent battle for territory between drug dealers. Viv's reputation grew quickly. He didn't just protect clubs and pubs, he also began offering a ruthlessly efficient debt collecting service. Here he would be used to collect from other drug dealers that owed money. Viv was good at his job and he knew how to handle himself. He trained every day. He didn't drink too often, maybe the odd time he'd have a Guinness. If anyone called him, he would follow it up. He didn't just leave it. If somebody phoned him, he would go and follow it through and would sort it out. He once got a call from a pub owner in North Shields, saying he had some Scottish fellas in there causing trouble and had robbed his till off all the money. He would offer Viv £500 to retrieve the money taken. Viv would turn up, order a drink and sit next to them. He would then ask if they knew how to handle themselves and they replied, yes, we can handle ourselves." before they knew it. He was knocking them out one by one. He went through their pockets, found the money and returned it to the owner. The owner would thank Viv and give him £500. During this time, a lot of hard men were doormen simply so they can control what drugs came in and who gets them in so they could also profit from the drugs. A lot of the time it's the doormen themselves controlling the drugs, having guys inside sell it for them or the gang they belong to. In February 1988, he was involved in an argument with a man called Carl Weller that spilled outside of a club. Viv punched the guy and unfortunately he fell down and whacked the back of his head and it caused a massive amount of brain injury. And as a consequence, Viv received an 18-month suspended sentence. This didn't stop Viv, but what it did do is make him catch them after he hit them so they didn't hit their head on the ground. Viv also survived several attempts on his life. They wanted to expand their drugs enterprises, but Graham was in the way. He and Rob Armstrong were once fired on from a passing car, a Nissan with blacked-out windows by a gang with pump-action shotguns outside Manhattan's nightclub in Newcastle. During the attack, Rob Armstrong was hit and required 60 pellets to be taken out of his body, but survived. Interestingly, he and Rob go to the local newspaper, The Sunday Sun, and they would call the shooter cowardly scum who didn't have the bottle to confront them properly. They also criticised the shooter for hitting Rob Armstrong in his back and while he was on the ground and say, look, you haven't scared me. Graham was aware of their plans to remove many of his men from the doors of the pubs and clubs of Newcastle. He was receiving death threats almost daily. There was an occasion when a car drove past Graham's home and one of the passengers shot out the windows of his house. Viv was at home with his partner, Anna, watching his favourite film, Zulu, at a volume so loud he almost didn't notice his lounge windows being blown in. Viv was also shot at during an incident that is believed to have been a revenge attack for an earlier unprovoked assault by Graham and a fellow bouncer, which left the victim with permanent injuries. And his reputation only increased further when Graham used his violent reputation to attack several well-known Tyneside hardmen. One doorman Viv didn't seem to like was Stuart Watson. There was a time when Stuart was out in Julie's nightclub and high on ecstasy, Viv would call him, and as soon as he turned around he would hit him with an uppercut, splitting his chin open. Up to this day, Stuart states he has no idea why he did that. The only thing Stuart could think of was that Viv was a bully, and he wanted to challenge anyone that had a bit of a name. Towards the end of 1989, Graham began working with the Sayers. Stephen Sayers from the notorious Newcastle crime family had been away for a year. He was back in town and reminding everyone who was top dog. The gang turned up to Hobo's nightclub on Newcastle's Bath Road. The then head doorman was Stuart Watson. Management had told him not to let any known gangsters in. When the gang arrived at the door, they were refused entry. This made Stephen Sayers furious. They would exchange words, but unable to intimidate the doorman, the gang would leave and soon returned, accompanied by Viv Graham and some of his associates. Sayers would say to Graham that Stuart was disrespecting them. 
Some of the people that were there was Stephen Sayers, his brother Michael Sayers, and Rob Armstrong. They would all make their way into the club, with Viv entering last. As soon as Viv Graham locked eyes on Stuart, Viv began delivering multiple punches to Stuart Watson and throwing the 28-year-old, 17-stone doorman around the reception area of the nightclub. He would then be dragged into the dance floor area. Towards the end of the fight, the gang would join in the attack, but Viv would stop them after they hit him a few times because knowing the Sayers, somebody would have ended up stabbing him and possibly killing him. And Viv was a fighter and would really hurt you, but Viv was not a killer. They would then leave the nightclub and be approached by officers that had just pulled up. Viv would keep his cool and state that he was the victim here. Undercover officers were actually standing in the area where the fight took place. This was all caught on CCTV. Police had set up surveillance. There was intelligence of drug dealing going on and people taking over the doors. The following day, Graham and the others were arrested for the attack. Despite Stuart refusing to give evidence, Viv would still be convicted. Stuart believes that the reason the police didn't interfere was because they were hoping the Sayers would have killed him that night, so the police could then put them in jail for life and finally have them off the streets. Viv Graham, along with Stephen Sayers and the rest of the gang, found themselves held on remand. At Durham Jail, while they awaited trial, the police were building a case which they hoped would take some of North East's most biggest names off the streets. It was a crazy time to be in jail. In April 1990, Inmates at Strangeways Prison in Manchester began a 25-day rooftop protest against squalid conditions in the jail. At least 50 prisoners climbed onto the roof of the building, throwing parts of the broken roof onto the courtyards below. A prison officer and a prisoner died, and nearly 200 inmates and staff were injured. It was the longest riot in British penal history. Durham Jail would try to follow what just happened in strange ways. A similar scenario began to play out in the prison chapel, but there was one difference. Philly Tobin was on remand with him at that time and was actually in the chapel on that day. He would say there were lots of people joining in, but then there's also a lot of people who are pretty frightened. And so Viv stood up and says something along the lines of, I'm walking out and these are following me. If any of you touch any of them, you know what you'll get. And that was that. And with those words, the riot was over before it began. Graham quickly became a favourite among the prison wardens, maintaining a somewhat peaceful environment. He enjoyed some of the best privileges in the prison due to his efforts. But it didn't all go well for Viv. There was a time when his partner Anna tried to smuggle cannabis into the prison for him so he could sell it. He would take it from her and place it in his mouth. As he went to leave the visit, the guards caught him, leading to a desperate struggle, trying to pry open his mouth. Viv would start to fight them off while chewing until he managed to swallow it. Viv was a bit concerned about the amount he swallowed and would ask Billy, the brother of Philly Tobin, What do I do? Billy would say, You will be okay. Just put your head down and sleep it off. As his trial date approached, Anna discovered his past infidelities, resulting in children with other women. When Viv met Anna, his ex-partner Gillian Lowes was pregnant with his first son Dean. But while he was awaiting trial, the same ex-partner gave birth to their second son, Viv Jr., and it didn't end there. Anna would then hear about a second woman, Julie Rutherford, who was pregnant with his baby. Anna had had enough. Overwhelmed and angry, Anna ended their relationship during a prison visit, throwing her engagement ring at him. She would tell Viv it's over, get up and leave and say, I'm never coming back. Viv Graham, Stephen and Michael Sayers, and another three men, all denied offences of violent disorder and wounding, and took it to trial. Judge Mary McMurray presided over the case. The jury at Newcastle Crown Court watched footage of the gang's violent actions. In the end, the gang agreed to plead guilty to a lesser charge of unlawful wounding. Viv Graham received a three-year sentence, while Stephen Sayers, his brother, and the others got two and a half years. Viv would actually get off quite lightly due to the fact he was still serving a suspended sentence for another violent incident. While serving his prison term, he was locked up with people like Charles Bronson, Curtis Warren and Lee Duffy. He even managed to settle a few personal scores. Viv had a knack for handling troublemakers, even those from his own pubs who landed on the same wing. A swift knockout punch was usually all it took. He got into a couple fights in jail, but nothing he couldn't handle himself. Despite his reputation, 
Graham was not universally liked among the inmates. One of the main problems with Viv was, if at any time screws couldn't handle the inmates for whatever reason, they would call Viv to sort it out, and Viv would go and sort the situation out, putting the inmate in their place. And not too many inmates was going to tell Viv to F off. On one hand, his ability to handle unruly inmates earned him the respect of the guards, who would often call upon Viv to quell any disturbances. But on the flip side, this made him a target of resentment among some of his fellow inmates. Charles Bronson even labelled him a rat and a bully, stating he held more respect for Lee Duffy. He would go on to say Lee was more solid, and how they beat up a pedophile to the point they almost killed him, using him as a punching bag. Lee Duffy and Viv Graham did interact in prison, with Viv cautioning Duffy to tread carefully and stop taking the piss. He made it clear that he wouldn't be an inmate forever, and that he would find Duffy on the outside if necessary. That conversation would end there, and Lee would leave his cell. Graham also took a keen interest in the case of fellow inmate Stephen Craven, who was serving a sentence for the murder of Penny Laying at Newcastle Studio Nightclub on Christmas Eve, 1989. Graham attempted to assist Craven, who protests his innocence to this day. While in prison, the police would start looking into Viv's financial situation. Word had gotten out about his large bets, and they couldn't figure out where the money was coming from. Authorities estimated his losses to be around two million from these high-stake bets. The police would go around to all the betting shops and places you could place bets and told them, if anyone comes in putting on big bets or spending a large amount of money, the police need to be notified. After 15 months, Viv would be released from Durham Prison. But a lot had changed in 15 months. Newcastle was unrecognisable. It was a city transformed by ecstasy and raves. What had started as a small underground movement had now exploded onto the mainstream. Things would never be the same again. A lot of gangs saw a lot more opportunity to make money. Gang activities increased and the nightlife was controlled by these criminal outfits, operating in and out of nightclubs and pubs. Once Viv was released, the first thing he'd done was go straight to his home where Anna lived. She didn't even know he was free, so it was a surprise he was home. She was furious at him for what he'd done, but they soon managed to patch things up and move forward. Viv would now work on getting his business back on track. He decided to break all ties with his former gangland associates, and a prolonged, bitter dispute ensued, with various adversaries working against Graham. Central Newcastle alone had thousands of young people gather every weekend, providing a profitable market for every kind of illegal drug. Viv's skills were still in demand among pub and nightclub owners, but the arrival of ecstasy had raised the stakes. With the rise of ecstasy, controlling nightclub doors became a lucrative business because it meant criminal gangs could also control the supply of the drugs into the venues. It got out of control with ecstasy, people were so on this drug, each venue would have multiple dealers. Now Viv didn't totally stop the drugs being sold, he would allow certain dealers into some pubs or nightclubs. That way he would know exactly what they had, and how many drugs was actually on the premises. They would pay him a cut at the end of the night. People didn't step out of line when Viv was in charge of the doors if he let you in to sell you better pay up. The dealers who dared to defy Viv's authority swiftly learned their lesson. With a swift punch and a swift kick, they were sent packing, a clear message to others who might be tempted to challenge Viv. It would be this move that would upset a lot of dealers, which would also upset multiple gangs, a move that only added to the chaos. The city's gangs were not pleased. Viv Graham protected many of the most lucrative bars and clubs and he was playing by his own rules. Keep in mind, each pill was being sold for £10 and the dealers would be getting them at £1 each. The profit margin was massive and Graham had a piece of the pie. Viv would reassert his dominance on Tyneside's nightlife. In a surprising move, Graham attempted to mend fences with Stuart Watson, a former rival. The two even worked together for a while but fell out over a money dispute. While he consolidated his home turf, Graham's reputation grew beyond the boundaries of Tyneside to the point he had offers for work from contacts in Glasgow and London, and even from the infamous criminal John Palmer, who was based in Tenerife at the time. Viv changed a bit after prison. Viv was drinking a lot more and heavily dependent on steroids. His adversaries saw their chance and began plotting against him. He had confronted a gang member in a Newcastle nightclub about supplying drugs in one of his establishments, and following a scuffle the man escaped via the fire exit with Graham in hot pursuit. 
The tension escalated when Graham banned several friends of Paddy Conroy, a notorious figure in the city, from an Italian restaurant in the cloth market. When Conroy heard about this, he and his associates made their way to the restaurant to find Viv. Instead of Viv, they would be confronted by his doormen. Someone from Paddy's group would throw an object through the window setting off the alarm. Paddy and his associates left the scene. They were actually spotted by police and chased. Police would later catch up with Paddy at his home address. He would then be arrested. Police say when they arrived, he tried to attack the officers with a knife, but witnesses would say he never had a knife and the police would just start attacking him before finally arresting him. He would be sentenced and had to serve some time for this incident. His family headed into Newcastle to drown their sorrows, so his friends and family spent the evening going pub to pub, having a drink. And when all the pubs closed, they ended up at a nightclub called Julie's. And at the door of this venue, they found Viv Graham, and he was surrounded by a group of equally big, steroid, bloated blokes. Viv pointed out a few in the group and said, You can go in. But he said to Michael Bullock, a close friend to Paddy, There's no way you're coming in. Michael took exception to this and said to Viv, You know, you're just a copper. So Viv said, If you're going to call me a copper, we're going to fight. Michael replied, Well, OK, let's get started. Michael was beating Viv, and Viv thought he was going to be knocked out. So he abandoned his boxing skills, grabbed hold of Michael, and managed to put him in a headlock. Viv overpowered Michael, struck him twice in the face, and Michael had suffered a broken jaw. Unsolicited confrontations were set up, one with a notorious, well-known, now-deceased fighter Lee Duffy, but that never took place. Graham's activities brought in a substantial income, occasionally exceeding £30,000 per week in 1992. However, he and his girlfriend Anna lived lavishly, spending money as quickly as they earned it. They both craved the high life and regularly tried to outdo each other by seeing who could blow the most cash. Their philosophy was easy come, easy go. There is even a story of Viv having to hide behind a settee when a debt collector came to visit, having blown the 30 grand meant for the debt collector the day before. Graham's radar also included young players from the renowned Walls End Boys Club and some of Newcastle's first team who enjoyed nights out. He took a particular interest in them, going out of his way to keep a watchful eye on their activities. He got to know many of them as a result. Viv made a big impression on these young players, especially midfielder Alan Thompson. Alan Thompson would see firsthand what Viv was like. When the two of them were in a pub having a conversation, two lads came in with baseball bats and told Viv to come outside. Viv said nothing. He just got up and walked outside. Alan Thompson decided to stay in the pub. Not even a minute later, Viv walked back in. Alan was confused. He looked outside and noticed that two guys lying there flattened out. In another incident at his favourite Italian restaurant, Viv was there with a friend called Rob Bell. Earlier that evening, Rob had annoyed a city villain called Peter Donnelly. He loaded his shotgun up and he went back to Tino's about midnight and he walked up to the table where Rob Bell and Viv Graham were sitting. Viv would notice he was armed and tussle the gun away from him. They would end up outside the restaurant fighting into an alleyway. Peter would end up running off. Viv would notice his friend Rob had been stabbed in the chest and would attend to him and help slow down the bleeding. By 1993, the criminal underworld of Newcastle was spiralling out of control with escalating violence and gun crime. The Sayers family ran a pub called the New Darnell. One evening, shots were fired through the windows into the pub, injuring Michael Sayers and another friend. Nobody was ever caught for this shooting a man who was suspected of being involved, was found dead at the bottom of a block of flats. On Christmas Eve of the same year, Graham was involved in another confrontation with a gang in Newcastle. An attempt was made to remove Graham's firm from an establishment, but the attempt failed as Graham, being there in person, repeatedly punched one of the guys in the gang, sending the others fleeing. During this journey of trying to run all the main doors, Viv would become very unliked. He had turned away drug dealers from clubs, which slowed down money for them. He had hit and knocked out drug dealers. He would also gain the reputation of being a bully. He had attacked and fought a lot of hard men and doormen simply based off ego. Stuart Watson said he saw Viv knock someone out because they took off their top in the club and had a good physique. He was also taxing drug dealers. Just before Christmas 1993, 
Viv and Anna finally moved into the house they'd bought. They planned to marry and move to a farmhouse in the country and live a quieter life together. Graham had even decided to quit gambling and stop taking steroids. By this time, so many villains wanted Viv out the way. Death threats were coming in daily. There were shootings happening. Viv would tell his fiancée Anna, I think they're going to shoot. Viv Graham wasn't the only target. That same summer, doorman Howard Mills lost a part of his leg in a shooting when he was shot as he left a bar. And Billy Robinson, the man who gave Viv his break on the doors, also fell prey to a bullet in Gateshead. On New Year's Eve 1993, Viv would be at home with his fiancée, Anna, in Walkerville, a new home they had just got a few weeks earlier. They had arrangements to go out later that night to bring in the new year. Graham would tell Anna that he had to quickly go down to the Queen's Head pub on Walls End High Street before they headed out for the night. A chilling phone call came through that night, a voice on the other end promising to shoot Viv. He would call Anna and tell her he is making his way home. Graham left the Queen's Head pub on Walls End High Street around 6pm to return to his car which he had parked in a side street. Viv would go into a nearby shop to buy cigarettes. A stolen blue Ford Escort would be parked and waiting in a back alley. Returning to his car, as he got closer he noticed his side window had been smashed out in his Ford Cosworth car. Suddenly a Magnum handgun emerged from the darkness firing three shots. One bullet went straight through his thigh. The second shot would hit him in the pelvis. The third shot ricocheted off the ground. The gunman ran back to the car and left the scene. After being left to bleed to death in the street, Graham was able to drag himself 30 yards up the street to the Queen's Head to get help, where he was found by fellow bouncer Terry Scott. An ambulance arrived, soon followed by the CID and police, to corner the scene off until the arrival of the forensic team. Within minutes of the shooting, Anna was notified by a friend and rushed to the hospital, arriving even before Viv. The well-known security boss was then rushed to North Tyneside General Hospital, where he received 30 pints of blood in an effort to save his life. Medics told Anna that Viv had passed away, that there had been nothing more they could have done to save his life. Graham died at North Tyneside General Hospital on December 31, 1993, aged 34. Around 10pm, four hours after being shot, the formidable hard man was gone. The shooting was suspected to be a revenge attack for an earlier assault by Viv and a fellow bouncer which left the victim with permanent injuries. However, this was never confirmed. He had a number of enemies who would celebrate his death. In the early hours of that morning, they were shouting from the corner house pub in Jesmond, Viv no more 94, Viv no more 94. Among those mourning Viv's death was his friend, former footballer, Paul Gascoigne, who was left devastated by the murder. Gascoigne would say Viv has always been a friend of mine. When visiting Newcastle, I sometimes came across Viv when he was in Macy's, a city centre bar, and I would stand with him and have a few drinks. As a friend, not a minder. Flowers would be left to mark the spot he was shot and killed. Dr John McCarthy, a forensic pathologist, said Viv's autopsy was actually pretty straightforward. The wounds to Mr Graham were to the upper parts of the legs and to the lower pelvis, and the damage essentially was vascular damage where these bullets had damaged major arterial structures, so the cause of death was relatively straightforward. He bled to death. My thoughts, of course, can't be substantiated, but the bullet wounds were in an unusual location, where the primary purpose was to kill somebody, people who are shot to be killed. It's hugely a chest wound, or the head. The unusual location of the wounds led McCarthy to speculate that the shooting may have been intended as a warning or punishment rather than a direct attempt to kill. In the immediate aftermath of the murder, police were keen to trace a distinctive man that was seen leaving the Queen's Head pub on Walls End High Street just minutes before Graham's shooting. The police said that he was quite distinctive, as he was only five foot and two inches tall. They said that he had short, cropped, mousy hair and had been wearing a long-sleeved dress shirt with a button-down collar. The police said that they believed that he walked east along the high street past Border Road. However, the focus of the investigation soon shifted to a blue Ford Escort car found burnt out in Heaton. The car had been spotted near the scene of the crime, and police believed it was linked to a gangland killing. 
they added that one of the main difficulties they faced was getting witnesses to come forward as they were afraid. His murder sparked a huge manhunt in which more than 1,000 people were interviewed, 500 homes visited, and hundreds of statements taken. The killer remained elusive. On the 4th of January 1994, the newspapers wrote an article asking why Viv Graham was a villain to some and a hero to others. It stated that it was claimed that he had been a drugs baron and had run a £2 million drugs empire and that he was an evil thug who terrified pub and club managers with a protection racket. However, the article noted that Viv Graham's friends and family said that he was a gent and a lovely lad who kept order in Tyneside's night spots. His father stated that Viv Graham was not a drug dealer and noted that proof of that was the fact that he was having his car repossessed. The police had also been probing Graham's financial empire, extending their inquiries as far as Tenerife in the Canary Islands. Another intriguing lead was John L. Gardner, a former British Commonwealth and European heavyweight champion from East London Hackney. He was also known for fighting Paul Sykes and making him quit. He would be brought in for questioning soon after the murder because it had come to light that him and Viv had an altercation a week before he was murdered. Viv would come into Gardner's pub that he had in Newcastle and try intimidate him. But Gardner wasn't having any of it, and they would almost come to blows, which gave him a potential motive. However, police eventually dismissed him as a suspect. During the Knight's murder trial, the jury at Leeds Crown Court heard how Lee Sean Watson had told police who was responsible for the shooting of Graham. The court was also told that after he was arrested for a separate offence in 1994, Lee Watson had boasted to police, you couldn't catch us for shooting Viv Graham. However, Watson's claims were widely disputed and he was never charged. Viv's funeral would take place at St. Patrick's Church near Highfield, where he would then be buried at Hookergate Cemetery in Gateshead, attended by his friends and family that were closest to him. In January 2014, it was reported that secret police files had been released that included statements. These files contained the statements of a man claiming to be the getaway driver in the shooting. This man, known as Lee Sean Watson, even named the gunman. The released documents showed that the police had gone to see the police informant Lee Sean Watson whilst he was in prison in February 1995 for the murder of Freddie Knights in Long Benton, and that he showed them where the safe house that they used following the shooting was. He told the police that he knew where the safe house was because he was the getaway driver and that he had driven them there after the shooting and also that he had stolen the getaway car. He claimed that the getaway car was a blue Ford Escort stolen from Bertley in Gateshead and then had taken it to Heaton. He said that he later picked up the gunman. The initial plan was to shoot Graham in the legs over some ongoing dispute. The duo then set out to find Graham. Lee Sean Watson then said that they drove to Viv Graham's home, but he wasn't there, and so they then drove around Wall's End looking for him, and eventually found his car off the high street next to a flower bed. He said that the gunman then got out and smashed one of the windows in Viv Graham's car, setting off the alarm, and then walked up and down, waiting for Viv Graham. He then said that he heard three shots fired and then saw Viv Graham on all fours beside his car, and that the gunman then ran back to the car and they drove off. Lee would go on to say that they then drove off to Heaton and set fire to the car in a back lane in Simonside Terrace and were then picked up by some other men and taken to the safe house. Lee said that the gunman had used a grey 357 Magnum that he had had in a shoulder holster and said that he thought that the gunman had been high on cocaine at the time. The police informant added that both he and the gunman both thought that Viv Graham had only been wounded at the time. It was pointed out to Lee Sean Watson that all the details of the murder had been well publicised and that he had not told us anything about the way the shooting was carried out that could not have been read in a newspaper. He was asked if he could give any details which could give credence to his story. He said that when driving the getaway car, he hit another car damaging the front of the car and he believed the car was a woman's because it had a box of tissues and some furry toys in it. He also said that he had a tape recording of the gunman bragging about the shooting. This had been recorded at a karaoke night in a Newcastle pub. The informant claimed to have the tape in safekeeping but would not disclose it. Viv's family offered a £100,000 reward for information leading to the conviction of his killers, but even that was not enough to break the wall of silence.
and even an apparent confession from killer and supergrass Lee Sean Watson during a separate court case came to nothing. Some of the people arrested and questioned for the murder were Darren Arnold, Karen Young, Brian Tate, Alan Jackson, Alan Wheat, Michael Sayers and Lee Watson. During the time, the police were investigating the murder of Viv Graham. The pubs were really quiet. People were very tense because it had just happened and nobody knew quite what to expect next. Owners had lost protection and could only wonder who was going to take over next. Will there be retaliations from Viv's death? One manager from a pub would say, managers feel very vulnerable, customers feel unsafe. We just don't know what's going to happen. We don't know who's trying to take over. We don't know what at this present time, but if they think they can come in here and take a bar over and smash up the place and that we won't do anything about it, they're wrong because we will. Viv Graham's death has left an opening in Newcastle's criminal world. Landlords, like Peter Connolly, find himself targeted by wannabe racketeers who were looking to move in on Viv's territory. The once secure doors of these establishments were now wide open to the terrors of the drug trade. Violence became a common occurrence and the fear that once kept these criminals in check had vanished with Viv's last breath. The fear of Viv was gone. Everyone was doing it. Friends of Viv would start getting in on the drug trade. Chet Sandu was one of them. He would go to be a prominent figure in the criminal underworld after losing his shop to fraud. He would then start to work the clubs as a doorman. He would start off importing steroids because most doormen were on them. He was making so much, he would go to Pakistan to the manufactories directly. He would soon expand his operations to include Valium, which brought in serious cash. In 1999, Chet was arrested at gunpoint at Orkin Airport with half a million pounds worth of black market pharmaceutical drugs. He was sentenced to four and a half years in one of Spain's toughest jails. Chet would say, We just thought we could just do what the fuck we wanted with no fear of anybody. Which wasn't what it was like when Viv was around, you know? Because he had control of everything, really. The drugs I was selling everywhere. I didn't care about anybody else. I did get told that I was selling drugs in a place where somebody else was selling. I said, I can't give a fuck what you're going to do about it. Theories about Viv's murder have been as numerous. Some say. A contract had been put on Viv Graham's head by the Sayers family because Viv and Michael fought outside the Madisons. Another family from Newcastle's West End had attacked Viv Graham in revenge for a recent attack on two of their family members in a pub. A witness said that they had seen three men in the Corner House pub in Heaton Road, near to where the Ford Escort car was later found burnt out, come in and be congratulated by three other men for a job well done. Andy Winder got into an altercation with Paddy Leonard. He would threaten Winder using Viv's name. Winder would tell Leonard if anything happens to me, I have money aside for Viv to be removed. Drugs barons in London, Manchester or Liverpool were angry that Viv Graham had set up a drugs ring in the North East, using contacts in Europe to import ecstasy into the region and arrange for contract killers to gun him down. Suspicion and accusations have swirled around who was behind the murder of the well-known Tyneside figure for decades, with many accusing Paddy Conroy, a well-known and connected face across the city. Paddy was the rival to the Sayers. Paddy would later become Britain's most wanted man. After escaping from a prison vehicle on his way to court, to face charges of kidnap, false imprisonment and torture, he went on the run in Spain before being captured and convicted. There was a regular group that went to the Queen's Head that Viv didn't like, that group would be Little Legs, Karen Young, Alan Jackson, Brian Tate and Darren Arnold. A week before the murder, Viv had a confrontation with Little Legs, breaking a rib in the process. Rumour is Viv was trying to intimidate Karen and Little Legs would stand up for her. In 1998, Northumbria police questioned this group about an alleged conspiracy to murder the bouncer. Karen would go on to admit that she doesn't think Viv would have hit her and he wasn't known for beating up women. It was believed that Viv Graham would do work for Sabre Security in Blackpool, which was run by John Hurd and John Barrett. Viv would end up doing things which would upset these people and they would place a hit on Viv. Crime families had hits out on Viv and Alan Wheat was the hitman. It's been three decades since the 34-year-old was gunned down outside a pub in Wall's End in a New Year's Eve killing that would go on to become one of the North East's most talked about crimes. No one has ever been brought to justice for Viv's murder and speculation about who pulled the trigger remains as rife today as it was in the days after the 1993 slaying. 
retired senior detectives have returned to work to join the team, who will work full-time re-examining old case files and evidence, looking for new opportunities to snare killers who have escaped justice for years. Detective Superintendent Jane Fairlam of Northumbria Police said, This tragic incident took place 30 years ago, but the investigation into Viv's death is not closed. We remain committed to establishing the circumstances behind Viv's death and will continue to act on any new lines of inquiry or information. Unsolved murders are never closed and are all subject to periodic reviews. If any new information comes to light about a case, our detectives make sure that it is fully investigated. Northumbria's Chief Constable Vanessa Jardine told the Chronicle that she hoped to bring answers to families that have been waiting years or even decades for closure. She said, It keeps me up at night. We haven't had a review team for quite some time. It's really important where we haven't solved cases that they are reviewed. My intention is that they will review every single one. Who was behind the brutal murder of Viv Graham? The truth, it seems, remains shrouded in the shadows of Newcastle's underworld. I would like to send my condolences to the family and friends for their loss. Rest in peace, Viv Graham. Thanks for watching. Until next time, like, comment, and subscribe, and stay safe.